Okay, thank you so much, Anthony, and the whole panel for such a wide-ranging discussion. Loving the audience participation uh, with the questions, so thank you for that as well. Um, now we're gonna switch gears, and uh, oh, we're gonna have to do the shush, aren't we? Shh. Oh, that worked even better. If we could close the doors as well, that would be awesome. Um, yeah, we're gonna switch gears and consider how we as parents and those of us from platforms can better support our teens online and create a greater sense of digital wellness. Um, our moderator for this session is Alexandra Veach. Uh, Alexandra leads YouTube's government affairs and public policy across the Americas. In this role, she advises the company on public policy issues, facing the platform, and liaises with government officials throughout the Western Hemisphere. Uh, to develop and implement policy agendas on technology issues. Uh, she comes to Google after a long career in public service, including as senior staff to President Barack Obama and Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, and experience leading government affairs for other large multinational companies. Please welcome Alexandra and her outstanding panel. Thank you. with all of you, and as Stephen said, I'm Alexandra Veach, Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy at YouTube. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to be here and talk with my fellow experts about digital well-being for teens. Responsibility is our number one priority at YouTube. With that in mind, YouTube recently released five overarching kids' principles that guide our work and we hope could be useful to policymakers. Let me just tick through these uh, quickly. So the first is the privacy, physical safety, mental health, and well-being of children and teenagers need special protections online. Secondly, parents and caregivers play an important role in setting the rules for their family's online experiences, particularly for their youngest children. All children and teenagers deserve free access to high quality and age appropriate content that meets their individual interests and needs. Fourth, the developmental needs of children differ greatly from those of teenagers and should be reflected in their online experiences. And finally, with appropriate safeguards, innovative technologies can benefit children and teenagers. With that, let me introduce my fellow panelists, and then we'll begin. <coughs> uh, my wonderful colleague and friend, Dr. Jessica Devento-Zubin. Always good to be with you. Dr. Jessica is YouTube's global head of mental health and is a licensed clinical psychologist. And then we have with us two amazing YouTube creators. Uh, YouTube creators bring the magic wherever they go. So uh, my, my friend, Stephanie Yates, Anya, Anya Bwile is a licensed marriage and family therapist who practices full-time in Atlanta, Georgia. Stephanie has a YouTube channel with over 10 million views, that's so incredible, uh, where she educates her audience on relationship dynamics, mental wellness, and careers in counseling, like hers. And then Gohar, nice to be with you again. Gohar uh, was recently at the White House for President Biden's signing of an executive order on AI, but when he's not in Washington, when he's home in Connecticut, Gohar spends his time creating educational content. He's an MIT grad and on a mission to help students succeed inside and outside of school. Ultimately, Gohar help, hopes his work can help alleviate the stress of school and empower students to achieve their goals. So Jessica, can we kick it off with you? You often talk about YouTube's vision to be known as the top destination for credible and helpful mental health information online. Uh, could you say a little bit more about how YouTube is working to achieve that goal with the content on our platform? Yeah, we, uh, we know that folks are coming to our platform for multiple reasons as it relates to mental health. We know that they're coming for authoritative content on mental health, like signs, symptoms, diagnoses, condition-based content. We also know that people are searching out emotionally helpful content uh, for times when they may be struggling. 
And so we um, really elevate as well product features that elevate lived experience content. We have a shelf called a personal story shelf to help people know what is it like to live with a certain condition. We also know that folks come to us in times of acute distress or times of crisis. And so we really want to also serve up uh, crisis resources with uh, authoritative partners across the world for people with, who are struggling with suicide, self-harm, substance abuse, or disordered eating behaviors. And so it is that uh, authoritative content where we have health shelves based on condition-based and symptom-based issues, lived experience content, and then our crisis resources. Thanks for that. And uh, I'm the mother of little kids. Something that I've heard from other parents is little kids, little problems, big kids, <laughs> big problems, right? Uh, and that makes sense to me given the pressures that teens face. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about their unique needs online? Yeah, I love that you say that. I have four kids in my house as well, it, ranging in ages from seven to 21. So we've got You've the got gamut the full there. You've got the span of <laughs> yeah. little to big. Little to big. Um, and certainly when we think about brain development for teens, a lot of people think of teens as just like younger adults. And the reality is their brains are different. Brain maturation doesn't actually take place now until the age of 26. It's that prefrontal cortex that's involved with emotional regulation, decision-making, processing speed. And so we certainly need safeguards in place for teens uh, in order to help them explore safely. At the same time, a critical time during teenage development is individuation and identity development. Actually becoming separate from the family system and seeing themselves as their own unique human. And so creating a safe space for them to explore their identity with that in mind is also critically important. It's interesting because uh, Jessica, I saw Stephanie nodding with a lot of what you said, your fellow clinician here on stage. So Stephanie, you have a unique perspective as both a clinician and a YouTube creator. Can you tell us a little bit more about how real world practice informs the content that you make online? Absolutely. So for me, I still work full time, as you said in the bio. So every day I'm in sessions with couples, individuals, families, and usually it's clear to me what videos need to be made based on what am I constantly talking about in sessions. So when it comes to relational dynamics, we're usually looking at miscommunication, attachment style issues, or there may be problems that we're seeing that are happening because people are dealing with insecurities, for example, that they don't know how to acknowledge, admit. And so often my videos are very much shaped by what I'm talking about most often in session. Um, and I, for example, recently have been getting more into like breaking down reality TV content and things like that, things I thought I would never be doing on my channel. But because people are watching these dynamics play out on screen, it's easier for them to recognize when they, when they apply to them, right? So being able to say, you see how there she was using this defense mechanism, and somebody says, oh my gosh, I always do that. I'm constantly splitting. Everybody's good or, and everybody's bad, for example. And so using the conversations I'm having in session as inspiration for videos, that'll be helpful. And using TV shows as the way to break that down, I found to be kind of the, the golden mix on my channel so that people can walk away with helpful advice and a little bit of entertainment. So Gohar, I, I loved hearing from Stephanie about how she sees what happens in the real world, saw a need and, and creates content to respond. I think that's uh, something you two have in common. So can you tell us about uh, what inspired you to get uh, started in creating and why create for teens specifically? Yeah, I'm happy to. So I started creating content for teens after drawing on my experiences going through the college admissions process. And I genuinely believe that nowadays the college application process is one of the most stressful things a young person experiences. And I think as we're seeing nowadays, you know, colleges are becoming more competitive. Uh, the average institution, for example, this past admission season uh, saw 30% more applications. And you know, with that, you're having more, you know, the average SAT, the average GPA at these scores is rising. And so I want to provide students and provide teens with a sense of clarity about the process. You know, when I was navigating the process myself, I didn't really have those resources around me. Uh, for example, you know, I'm a first generation student, so I really kind of had to figure out, you know, what is the FAFSA? What is the Common App? And I think just kind of bridging this gap between, you know, what students have to do and what they actually know is what I aim to do on my YouTube channel and with the content that I make. And you know, I, I've seen it work. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm making short form content about 
how to fill out the Common App, you know, how to find scholarships. And it's incredibly rewarding to see that students are now having uh, and gaining access to the information they need to succeed in the admissions process. Uh, and Gohar, we talked a little bit about th this uh, world of uh, big kids, big problems. Tell me a little bit more about the anxieties that you're hearing from teens and, and how a platform like YouTube or others can help improve uh, their well-being. Yeah, so I think teens nowadays are struggling a lot with the sense of purpose. Uh, and, and I think a lot of, you know, in my comments especially, I see students asking about, do I go to a two-year, do I go to a four-year? Do I study computer science? Do I study the humanities? And I think a lot of students are trying to figure out, you know, what they want to be when they grow up, or what they want to study in college, or, or, or what the right path even is in the first place. And so with my content, you know, my goal isn't to answer these questions. You know, I'm not here to say, you should study computer science because of X, Y, and Z, or you, know, you should go to a two-year because I think this is the best for you. Ultimately, my goal is to provide students with the information they need to make these decisions for themselves. And I, I think ultimately that's what YouTube allows me to do because you know, I can make content about five different majors and YouTube will surface you know, each of these short form videos to the students who might be interested in each of these majors and help them you know, finalize a decision about okay, yeah, this sounds like the right fit for me, or maybe, maybe it's not. And so, you know, ultimately, I, I think it comes down to purpose, and I hope that my content can help students, you know, kind of begin to gain clues and, and figure out, you know, what viable routes might be for them. So when I talk about YouTube, um, just to ground ourselves in some uh, statistics, 500 hours of content uploaded every single minute, 2 billion monthly logged in users. Uh, Stephanie, I'd ask you, what does a global platform like that, with that sort of reach, mean in terms of your ability as a creator to reach those who might not have access to the kind of resources that you provide in an in-person clinical setting? I love that question because that's the main reason that I got on YouTube, mm -hmm. is that I was recognizing that a lot of the conversations I was having in sessions were repetitive for me and that there's information that so many people don't know that clinicians look at as basic premises for healthy communication, for example. And so I started looking at how could I, A, help people who were interested in doing this work, because as a marriage and family therapist, it's such a small community within mental health, but a lot of people just don't know of it that it's a career option. So I started my channel with trying to make sure people knew about this in the mental health field and letting people know the difference between systemic thinking when it comes to working with people versus using some of the more linear processes that some of the other mental health um, fields, which are very credible and valid, use, but this is more effective, I think, for family style counseling. And so learning first that there were a lot of people who didn't even know about marriage and family therapy, and then using marriage and family therapy techniques and tactics to help people improve their relationships in their actual life. I've had people tell me, you know, I can't afford to go to therapy, and this has been really helpful for me and my partner. We watch all of your videos together, for example. Um, I've had people talk about watching certain videos with their kids to help make sure that they know certain things that would look healthy and what would be unhealthy in a relationship. I think a lot of times we just really don't know uh, that we even need the support, and sometimes seeing a video like mine opens people's eyes up to the fact like, oh, this is an issue that not only is normal, but has a name. Like I have language around this. Now I know what type of therapist to look for to help me with this. So I think that having a platform that is so widely accessible makes it so that people can find you at whatever stage of change they're at. Whether they know they need to change or not, there's something on YouTube that they can look at that will probably help them at that stage in life. And just out of curiosity, I'm sure you hear from um uh, many users about the impact of your content. Do you hear from fellow professionals uh, in your field? What do you hear from them? That's my favorite thing because I think the first thing coming out on YouTube, you know, I'm going to be a content creator and a therapist, and I was very, very early on in my career, was imposter syndrome. Just feeling like other therapists are going to watch this and say, what is she <coughs> talking about? It's, it's okay. Sorry. The other therapists are going to be like, what is she talking about? That's incorrect. You know, just being so worried about saying the wrong thing. And sometimes when you have that fear, it makes you really ineffective because you don't want to say anything. 
Um, but I thought that it was important to bridge the gap between wanting to become a therapist and having that information. Once I started putting information out there, other therapists would say, I've actually been using your videos in my class. Like I have people who are therapists, clinicians, who are also professors, and my videos are in the syllabus for their classes. <laughs> There's nothing more uh, rewarding, you know, or validating than to hear that because I was so, I was paralyzed with fear to put content out there, being afraid that what I was saying would be unhelpful or redundant or inaccurate. And so hearing from other professionals that they're using the videos to help educate upcoming professionals, I think is what keeps me really, really motivated in this work. I love hearing that. It's, it's almost more meaningful than that 10 million views, right? I, I'm <laughs> in a syllabus, so other people are learning from me. Um, Jessica, we are in a room of uh, rich with deep and genuine expertise. Can I ask you how you work with outside experts to help inform product updates and policies? Uh, one thing I know is that platforms can't make these decisions alone. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll try to put it in context by talking to you about some recent launches that we did and how we worked with experts in order to bring those to life. And so, yes, I am a psychologist and I have my own kind of clinical expertise, but I can't be an expert in everything. And I also want to make sure that we're doing due diligence to find expert consensus in what we do. So you can think of my role kind of like a clinical translator, where I work with the world's experts and find the research out there and then make sure that that clinical integrity isn't lost when we go down to product or policy application. And so it's a really fun, fun role. So a couple of recent launches that we've had, um, and again, we're working with UXR, individual experts in the space. We have a family advisory committee, which is 12 experts across child development, digital media, uh, and clinicians in the space. Um, we have um, uh, partners as well, like the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention that inform our policies and our practices and many, many folks in the space who are experts, and then we go and find that consensus before we sort of create any product roadmap or policy roadmap. So we just recently launched a huge um, kind of teen safety and well-being launch with, across multiple things. So through UX research and through expert feedback, we've revamped our take a break and bedtime reminders to be full page panel interstitials to make it uh, create a better pause for younger users to just take a moment and think about making an informed decision about their content consumption on our platform. We've actually changed our, uh, the way that we recommend content for content that in isolation may not be harmful, but in large concentrations could be harmful to younger users. So this is, for example, social comparison content to reduce kind of negative impact on body image and um, social aggression content to reduce sort of the negative impact on potential real world violence. And we worked with our family advisory committee um, in order to, to launch that product. We have a partnership that we just announced with the World Health Organization and the Brit British Medical Journal where they are actually going to be developing for us, for the industry really, uh, principles on developmentally appropriate mental health content for teens and younger users, as well as communication strategies for mental health resources for these populations. Uh, we're working with Common Sense Networks to actually, we've launched a guide on teen and family creation on content for teens. Um, and so that's been very valuable. And we also have revamped our suicide self-harm panels, suicide self-harm and disorder eating panels it is now, we've warmed up the graphics and it's a full page interstitial. First and foremost, we still wanna drive people to a real world human interaction. So we make our sort of crisis hotline partnerships really prominent at the top. However, through research, we found out that only a small percentage of people, while these resources and hotlines are critical, only a small percentage of people would actually ever consider using one when they're in an, in acute distress. And so we realized we needed to do more. So we've also worked with experts to align on self-help topics that are um, evidence-based and proven to be helpful in a crisis situation. So grounding exercises and building self-compassion. 
to give the users an opportunity to create a different sort of more helpful pathway out of that crisis state. And then if they still wanna see the content, they actually have to click through to see the content. And we worked with global experts in, in crisis response um, to develop that. That's really interesting. I think one of the through lines there is that those are all product features that we really want our users to take advantage of, right? We, we want them to note the take a break reminders. We want them to take advantage uh, of the resources they need in, in those moments of crisis. Um, something, uh, and let me shift back to uh, my two creator friends, Gohar and Stephanie. Uh, we know policymakers are thinking about the role of algorithmic recommendations um, and, and what a, appropriate policy making might look like there. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how YouTube recommendations um, have potentially helped you grow your audiences or connect with um, users who are looking for the kind of uh, authoritative content that you produce? Yeah, so I think when I think about educational content, especially for you know the, the audience that I produce content for, I realize that it all has to be very personalized. So for example, like the advice that I upload, you know, a video about you know, scholarships might not be applicable to a ninth or 10th grader, but it might be super relevant for an 11th or 12th grader. You know, a video that I upload about extracurricular activities or how to take the SAT or the ACT. You know, th these are all videos that are just relevant to very specific segments uh, and, and only relevant during a very specific period of time during a young person's life. And so I think the recommendation algorithm, for example, you know, I can have confidence in uploading videos about these rather niche topics and you know, have the assurance that it'll reach the students who need to see that content and the students who want to see that content. And you know, over the past couple of years, I've been uploading almost <coughs> you know, one short form video every other day. And the recommendation algorithm alone, you know, I haven't had to do any outside publicizing, has allowed me to garner an audience of over three million subscribers, which has just been mind blowing. Honestly, you know, I, it's, it's incredible to see you know, how this educational content now is reaching students domestically, internationally, you know, students who just need help, you know, both, you know, in school, but then also outside of school with, with, with other topics as well, such as, you know, mental health, uh, fitness, well-being, and, and it's great to see how it's all branched out. Stephanie, what about you? I think for me, the algorithm, you know, you put out content and it goes to people who are subscribed to you. And then sometimes you put out content that's relevant to such a large audience that YouTube recognizes more people need to see this. And so I remember back in 2021, I put a video out breaking down the family dynamics in Encanto. And um, that for me was a video that was very uncommon for my channel. I, I don't know if I'd ever even broken down a movie before, but that was my first video to ever reach over a million views. And that's because so many people resonated with different family members within that family. If you haven't seen the movie Encanto, definitely watch it. Um, but it's one of those things where it is something that if you don't have the language to describe why you resonate with one of these characters or which family dynamics feel familiar to you that you'd like to work and course correct, um, you need language. You need to be able to show someone this is what that looks like. Go to this timestamp in this video. This reminds me of us, for example. And the comments on that video really showed me there was a lot more work to be done in helping people heal multi-generational trauma, for example. And I think that it opened my eyes up to a whole new world of content that my users needed, or people that weren't even my subscribers, right, just needed this content to help heal family dynamics. And so it gave me valuable information, the fact that the video was being pushed out to people who wouldn't normally watch my videos, and completely reshape the way I do content. When you talk about healing those intergenerational uh, dynamics, I think you're saying we should talk about Bruno, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's an encanto joke. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Gohar and Stephanie, what advice would you give to creators like you, but in an earlier stage, maybe starting out wanting to produce this really valuable, nutritious content? What would you tell them to do? I think Stephanie touched upon this, you know, in your earlier answer about, you know, th th this idea of self-doubt as you're making your content, you know, like struggling to think whether, you know, what you're saying is correct or whether people will resonate or whether, you know, authority will think that, you know, what you're saying is, you know, factual and, and, and kind of, you know, helpful in the first place. And so for me, you know, it's, it's, if you're in an earlier stage, I, I think ultimately the advice you'll hear is to just begin posting. Uh, I, th I think ultimately it's just, 
feeling comfortable enough to share your advice and, and, and share your insights, share your perspective, even if you know, may, maybe you haven't fully figured out you know, what the content themes are gonna be like or, or, or what the production quality is gonna be like. I, I, th I think a lot of people, a lot of early creators struggle even before they make their first video because they're trying to figure out uh, the variables that aren't that important or maybe outside of you know, the core substance of, of the message they wanna communicate. So I think ultimately it's just having the confidence to, to really just begin uh, and, and to kind of stick it through and, and, see, and see where it takes you. Yeah, I think for me I would say in addition to what Gohar is saying is consistency and allowing yourself to explore and experiment with content. I think when I first started I had such a clear idea of what this channel is going to be about. This is a serious channel and I'm going to be talking about how to become a marriage and family therapist. And even though there was a lot of need for that, there was such a larger audience that needed support in a completely different way. And for a while I wasn't open to that because I didn't want to be looked at as someone who's just hopping on trends and doing things. But realistically, when you are able to show someone content based on shows, movies that they've seen, it's easier for them to digest a lot of jargon and information that might go over their head otherwise. I mean, I'm only an expert in a very specific thing and everything else, I need somebody to break it down for me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that being willing to be open to what your audience is asking for, testing things out, exploring, especially I was telling someone, I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago where I was, you know, there, it was full of creators. And they were saying, you know, what do you do when you wanna try something different and you're afraid you're gonna lose your audience? I say be willing to lose a few and gain some more because there is an audience that's interested in whatever you're the most excited to talk about at that time. And I think that being able to step out and be authentic in that way will make people really engage with your content and resonate with your content because they know that you're enjoying what you're doing. I have a, yeah, a, please, a, a thought out as yeah. well because we have a lot of uh, authoritative organizations in this room who want to create content for teens and part of what my team does is partner with those organizations and help them meet their audience's needs. Um, and the reality though is a lot of teens are really leaned into peer content. Teens tend to have less stigma about mental health than older generations and they're more willing to talk about it, and it for, to be a part of the everyday conversation but they're not necessarily watching the authoritative channels on mental health content. And so what I love, for example, about your work and your work is you're meeting teens where they are and talking about topics that resonate for them, whether it's talking about mental health at the intersection of entertainment, for example, it's going to land and resonate with them. And so um, a lot of feedback that we get from our younger users is the content needs to be developed for them by them, for teens by teens. And so we encourage authoritative organizations to partner directly with teens in creating the content. An example of this is the American Academy of Pediatrics has an Asking for a Friend series, and I love it because it's teenagers interviewing pediatricians about really risky topics that are, are kind of difficult to talk about. The top viewed video for that series is about how to help a friend who's cutting, mm. and it has over 20,000 views, yeah. And so that just tells you the, the appetite really is out there. And then also partnering uh, really top creators with experts as well to have these conversations. Child Mind Institute has a, um, it's called hashtag my younger self, and it's celebrities and famous creators giving advice to their teenage selves about what they, what they wish they would have known then to help their life be a little bit more easy. And can I follow up there and just ask Jessica, um, we've talked a little bit about recommendations, uh, helping uh, users discover content they love, helping our creators build audiences, but can you talk about how uh, it also helps authoritative organizations like uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, get reach for their content? Yes, absolutely. So our recommendation system actually helps us elevate high quality content and we actually have an authoritative ranking system when people are looking for certain queries like mental health we have an authoritative ranking system that helps us to elevate that high quality authoritative content in that space to users so that they can make a more informed decision about their their health super lightning round last question <laughs> stephanie and gohar um, tell us an anecdote that's really stuck with you about your content and its impact on, on your viewers. Stephanie, starting with you, and then we'll close with Gohar. 
I think for me, whenever I can hear comments about the multi-generational impact of videos, that is what really resonates with me. So I've recently finished breaking down the Twilight series and relationship dynamics in Twilight. Um, that was a nerve-wracking one to do. <laughs> but I love some of the comments that I was getting from fellow millennials who were like, I watched this with my teen. And um, what was really encouraging for them is that she already recognized the toxic dynamics that at 20 years old, a lot of us still hadn't recognized. And so I think that that makes me very motivated to see what's possible with social media and educating teens on healthy relational dynamics. Awesome. And Gohar, over to you. Yeah, so you know, two years ago, I got a message from a student who applied to a summer program that I had suggested in one of my videos, or just talked about briefly in one of my videos. And you know, he sent me a message saying that thanks to that one video, you know, I had one of the most incredible summers of my life. <coughs> you know, like, he, he kind of shared that he had really life-defining moments that summer just because, you know, he decided to say, hey, you know, I, I think the summer program might be worth it. Saw it in one of Gohar's shorts. And, you know, I think back to that realizing, you know, sometimes to me I just feel like I'm just surfacing normal content or just concepts that maybe many students are aware of. But just to see that, you know, that there's such a gap between, you know, what opportunities are available and maybe what's actually publicly uh, what's in the public knowledge, you know, just really realizing how wide that gap is helps me just, just stay motivated to keep posting content and to make sure that students have access to information that can, uh, you know, open up and unlock new opportunities. Super. We'll, we'll pause there and, and thank you to Gohar and Stephanie for your commitment to creating authority, authoritative content that can help people, to Jessica for your leadership on behalf of uh, online well-being, team well-being, and thanks to everybody in this room, as I said, a rich source of uh, expertise. And we'll be around afterwards if anybody wants to talk further. Thank you.